I'm really excited to have you. I love your work. And, um, and I think this is a really good topic. I, I will say that I did a poll on LinkedIn just for fun, um, promoting this episode. And I asked people, does your manager get you? And last I checked, actually, about it was about half and half people saying yes and no. Um, maybe even more people saying, yeah, my manager gets me. And um, it, was that, is that surprising to you? I'm just going to check it right now. You know, I'm going to I'm going to make an assumption in my answer. It doesn't surprise me for the sort of people who are smart enough to follow you on LinkedIn. <laughs> because because we have uh, we tend to, I believe, uh, really embrace our own agency and our relationships. Uh, we tend to be more collaborative and open and and maybe even a little bit more vulnerable in our roles as both leader and as as uh, worker, as follower, if you will. Uh, so th those uh, those don't surprise me for this particular audience. I think we're, I, I'd love to see that poll done with um, food service workers and first responders and teachers and, and a whole layer of people who are still, I think, working under the assumption that the boss is always right. You can't question or challenge him or her. And, and, you know, your job is to go 110%, even if you feel like the organization you work for is only clocking in at 70. And so, you know, it's that dynamic, I think, that's shifting for so many people and where they feel this disconnect with their work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I will say, I think today we are going to focus on a knowledge worker audience. Um, given my audience, given that we're on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. I know these 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 topics are very, very much dependent on what you do and what what kind of work you do, you know. Um, so we really talk a lot about uncertainty, and rightly so. It's been, to me, the word of the year. Um, <laughs> but of course, I think one of the words of the year was empathy, right? So you probably liked that. Um, why is uncertain? Why are we obsessed with uncertainty? And why is it so powerful in how we work today? And, and what do leaders need to know when they think about an uncertain world? Well, there's so many vectors into that question. So maybe we'll we'll just work our way around it. You know, we live in uncertain times. You know, no one expected a pandemic. Right? And then boom, we had it. And all of the ways that we had to shift and change and adapt to, to the way we worked, the way we were partners in our relationships, the way we parented, the way we cared for one another, all of that shifted really dramatically. And I think we're still, you know, now nearly four years on, we're still wrestling with that, that kind of, of change. And so when you, you can't be clear of the outcomes, you naturally have this uncertainty. And more and more, I think we're not, uh, I'll say as and the environment changes, as uh, innovation shifts the playing field as geopolitical the world unfolds. We don't know how things are going to turn out. We have to do a lot more experimenting and testing to, to kind of prove our hypotheses or at least test them for the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the way we get to certainty is not by knowing the outcome, but by knowing the process. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what strong leaders do is say, listen, I don't know. We're going to find out together. Mm -hmm. We're not sure what the destination may be. We, we think we see it, but here's how we're going to get there. Here's how we're going to think about it. I promise you that in these conditions, this is the way I'm going to operate and this is the way we'll operate together. That, I think, creates a, a promise of certainty in an uncertain world because, again, we don't know the outcomes, but if we know how we're going to work together and we know how we're going to discover where we're going together, um, it's a lot easier to take those steps. It's a, th that gives you the certainty, the confidence, the psychological safety to, to move forward. And that's, I think, the best thing a leader can do right now. Uh, it, to use a therapy term, you create a holding environment, right? You you create a place where, again, the, the outcome is not guaranteed, but the fact that you are going to be sort of safe in the process, at least. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, I think you know, some of, we talk about this, Heather, I, so I wrote um, The Empathy Advantage and The Adaptation Advantage with Heather McGowan. So I want to, when I say we, it's not some pretentious royal, royal we, it's actually <laughs> two of us who have been 
thought pro partners on this for a long, long time. Um, but we, we talk about you know, what Brian Chesney did uh, when he made the first layoffs around and the um, around the pandemic and around what was going on at Airbnb. And he, he basically wrote this amazing letter that said, listen, I don't know where this is going, but I promise you, this is the way I'm going to think about it. And I promise you that as soon as I know, you'll know. And I promise you that we're going to get through this. And I can't promise that everyone's going to come along, but I promise you, I'm going to tell you what you need to know as soon as I know that you need, need to know it so that you can make your own decisions. And, and I think that kind of a frame just, it, it doesn't, again, eliminate the uncertainty, but it makes it a lot easier to show up fully and be part of a process. And, and by doing that, help to drive to a more certain outcome. Yeah, I like that. So um, one of the sort of really bold statements your book, The Empathy Advantage, makes is you can't manage like you used to because your workforce expects different things. Mm -hmm. What is the empowered workforce? Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very tempted to use a very direct statement, but one, it's, a, <laughs> well, it's a workforce that says, I don't need this job. It's a workforce that says, I need, uh, uh, I know what I need for myself. I have a sense of who I am and what I need and what my purpose might be. And I want to align with an organization and a leader that will get me there. And if you're not that, and if I'm not respected for the value that I create, then this isn't the right place for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily saying, you know, you know, go pound sand, but saying, I know where I'm going to fit. And if I don't fit here, I'm going to move on. And so I think it leaves uh, for leaders the opportunity to get to understand where those points of fit are to understand who the person is behind the, the productivity or the, the production and to, um, to also help make that decision. I mean, I think as leaders, some of the hardest but best conversations we have are the ones that say, um, how do I help you be the best you can be in this work? And if, if it's not here, how can I help you find a place where you can be fulfilled? Yeah. That it's, uh, you know, it's not to anybody's gain to have someone in a role, um, where they don't feel that they are able to contribute 100% and where you're not able to get that uh, productivity or per performance. I, I think performance is a better word than productivity these days uh, from that person. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, I was having a conversation with my friend, Rahel Ellison, yesterday, and she was saying that she's the more and more she thinks about it, she thinks productivity is really just people operating from a state of just... I would say anxiety, she would say sort of hyper arousal, you know, just completely, completely um, functioning at a level that is driven from fear and stress. And again, you know, just trying to make things okay. Mm -hmm. um, you write, you work for talent. <laughs> <laughs> and and then that, that's piece that's a piece I would assume of of sort of living in this world of the empower workforce. But what is that? What what is that? What is a manager's job when the manager works for talent? I, very simply, it's to create the environment and provide the resources so that your people can perform for the to the goals of the organization. Right? It's the, this you know kind. Of, let me back up a little bit and say, you know, I think, and I wasn't thinking about this when we were writing this book, but I think this condition is true. And as, as a result, um, we're coming through, and as a result, I don't think the pandemic changed anything, but it certainly amplified a lot of things, right? And it, and it accelerated everything. And I think the thing that it's accelerated is a transformation from a very industrial economy kind of leadership. I'm the boss, you're the worker, you do what I say, you, you're in at this hour, you're out at that hour, and I'm going to count all the widgets you made all day, whether those widgets are actual widgets or cells in a spreadsheet or some greater analysis or a wonderful PowerPoint deck. I'm going to hold you accountable to produce something. That's a very, I think, end-stage capitalism kind of uh, workforce management. And that you see it in certainly... Um, you know, sort of very 
uh, working class, very knowledge worker. I you see it across the board, right? I'm the boss. I know better. Please, if you're lucky, please do what I say. Or, or of, in my former life, you're billed by the hour. So they can literally say yeah. you didn't meet your hours. That's right. And, and so it's about, uh, you know, kind of driving. And I, I was going to use the term, what was the natural turn to come out of my mouth um, was crack the whip. And I, I stopped that. I, I realized because that is a word that um, a phrase that is derived from chattel slavery. But when you think about the way most many leaders through the industrial era led, it was, you know, I might pay you, but I'm going to pay you the least I possibly can and extract the most I can possibly get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that modality is come to an end. And as we shift to a human value era, one that we're, you know, we're partnering with innovation, with AI, with one another to really create new value, we have to think about leadership differently. And we have to think about what we count and what we measure differently. And, and the reason I'm pushing back from productivity is productivity is one of those easy to count numbers. How many hours did I put in? How many things did I create? How many, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, it's these very measurable KPIs. In a, in a performance economy, it's about where are we creating new value? How did we identify new markets? How are we serving and retaining and engaging our customers? The questions are really different and they're harder to measure. And so as we usually do as human beings, we, we go away from the things that are hard and we move to the things that are easy and we go back to, well, how many hours did you put in? Did I see you in the office today? Because this whole return to office thing is get, you know getting people uh, in a twist. All of those things are about the way it used to be. And that's the push pull we have right now in, I think a lot of leadership circles and why we say, what got you to your leadership role, right? Which was emulating that kind of command and control leadership is not going to serve you well as a leader going forward because you're doing something really different. You're, uh, you're innovating, you're abstract, you're identifying new value, you're capturing opportunity. And those things get um, done in a really different way. And it's about making sure the people who are working with you know that you are a partner with them in making them as complete in their work environment as possible, making it possible for them to have a performance that's outstanding. Mickey says so many great gems coming. Thank you. And um, please um, jump in if you have questions in the chat. We will um, we will answer your questions. So so Chris, I'm just going to pose to you the question which I titled our live today, which is what so what do, so what does it mean to be a good manager today when you work for talent? It means being more human than you think you ought to be at work. I think in, in a nutshell, right? Because we but that's hard and that sucks and that's also dangerous. It, it's all of those things, right? And it's all the things. And I, you know, I, I love your work and and your honesty and your vulnerability about those those kinds of relationships. It is hard, right? and I think that when you can be vulnerable to the idea that you don't know everything, that you're not exactly sure where you're going, that there is this uncertainty, but can be very solid about. I want to know who my people are, what motivates them, how when we come together we work effectively, where are we missing one another and how do we how do we bridge those misses? Um, what do my people need so that we can discover together a valuable future? And that sounds somewhere up here when what you want to do is say, but I got everybody back in the office and we're all working uh, really well and we exceeded our hours and our sales quotas. And, and I realize those things are all realities too. Uh, I, I think one of the things we have to go back and look to is during the pandemic, when people were home, when people were were managing their own time, they were juggling parenting and, and maybe even elder care or just the craziness of, of can I can I breathe freely today? Um, productivity actually increased. Yeah, and and so it kind of says when you lift the pressure off of your people to perform in a certain way, uh, a prescribed way that works for you, but maybe not for them, they actually do pretty well. We can trust people to, uh, to perform. Right. I always joke, when you treat people like grownups, they usually act like grownups, you know? That's I mean, right. most, most people want to do a good job. Yeah, and when you treat people like children, they behave like children, and it's pretty clear. 
<laughs> it's really amazing that way, isn't it? You know, so I, I we treat leadership and uh, as this mysterious, complex thing, and in some ways it really is. And I'm just looking up at my bookshelf with all the books on how to lead, and it's it's been uh, made for quite a library. But I think at the, at the end of the day, it's how do you how do you be more human, engaging with humans to help us all be more. Uh, I, 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 I don't know if actualize is the right word here, but to, to really achieve our potential, to really tap into, to understand what our potential is and co-create a world we want to live in together. And, and that's, I say, it, it's like, it's really easy, but that's also really, really hard to do. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday. Um, I, this is going to be a little circuitous, but bear with me. So one of the favorite um, pieces in your book is that, um, you talk about a, a quote from the book Sapiens um, by Yuval Hariri. I'm going to forget his name, but I think it's anyway, it's a, you know, everyone knows the book Sapiens. It's a huge bestseller about how, you know, we're so fundamentally insecure as people because our shift from prey to predator was very quick. And unlike lions, we're not actually very well protected and so when we stand up in front of a room and expect people to pay attention to us and think we're smart we're just loaded with insecurity and anxiety mm -hmm. and and there are very deep reasons for this um and what's interesting so to be the kind of leader that you're talking about is a lot about letting go of that insecurity and anxiety and again just being like here i am soft underbelly come at me yesterday my son in his middle school basketball game started and played a lot of the game. And he's a very good athlete, but he's never played basketball before. The coach kept him in and that made the coach really vulnerable and made the team vulnerable. And we were playing our rival. <laughs> and I was like, oh, maybe the coach should take my son out. <laughs> but, but the coach played my son and I talked to the coach after and he goes, He's such a hard worker. Freaking love that kid. Like, so Boston. I loved it. Love you, Coach Shannon. And I was thinking about what you wrote about how to bring out the best in the people who work for us and who learn under us requires us to take risks and be vulnerable and not always do what we know is going to guarantee a great outcome. Mm -hmm. That is so hard. Yeah, that's where so much discovery it's like if your son didn't play that full game how would the coach ever know his capacity to play a full game or to to be a great i don't know what position he didn't he play the full game but he played a lot yeah but and and it's i think those kind of real uh real life settings help us learn a lot about ourselves you know here's the thing and i think you're absolutely right I, you know, we uh, we we walk in the world as uh, we try to as these confident, all-knowing, quite self-assured people. Well, all the while as we're you know going through the, our daily lives, there's this little voice in our head going, "You're not good enough. You're not good enough." You know what? You think so and so thinks this about you. So and so could not care, right? It's this, <laughs> but we have this this constant. I do anyway. I'll say this constant chatter of what I assume other people assume about me, assuming about that in this weird loop, right? And I had this amazing experience several months ago where I said, yeah, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop. I'm going to at least catch myself when I think I need to do X because somebody might expect that I would do X, yeah. even though I'm not good at X or I don't want to do X or, you know, something else. And, you know, it relieves so much pressure. And then I could actually deal with what people actually expected and not what I assumed they expected. And I could have conversations about that and just be able to say to someone, hey, listen, I'm going to put you in for the whole game. And the reason I'm doing that is I just want to see you play. And I don't want you to you know, try to be a grand standard. Just, I just want to see you play because we'll learn something in that. Yeah. And, and to be able to say, you know, the, the, you know, maybe the, the, the dad or the mom of the, the, you know, six two middle schooler is saying, "Why isn't my kid in the game? He can, you know, he can dunk." Um, <laughs> None of them can dunk. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but but my point, you know, that somebody else wants, you know, and the coach sitting there is able has to be able to say, you know what, this is what the team needs right now to understand our capacity, and that will only happen if we do these things. And I'll be okay saying to the parent that didn't whose kid didn't play enough minutes, this is what we're doing to build a better team. Yeah. And so I think that that you know, at least for me, the ability to say, is this truly an expectation, or is it my imagined expectation that is creating an, um, an environment of anxiety and uncertainty that is preventing me from actually doing the thing I know that needs to be done. Right, right. And, and actually a huge piece of being a good manager, I have a whole speech on this, is actually asking, what do you expect of me? Right. And not assuming. Um, I'm just gonna put this comment up. Masterful supervision requires a pretty high level of vulnerability, right? The manager's ability to say, I don't know, I can't, I messed up. It humanizes us. It's humbling and necessary. That's the stuff that builds trust and ultimately, yes, a hundred percent. So, so, so that great, yes. And oh sorry, go you start. I'll give you my yes and yes, and to say I don't know is just the first step. The second step is, so let's find out, or let's find out, how are we going to learn together? How are we going to figure this out? So that there's not just a, I don't know, we're, we're screwed. It's, I don't know, let's, let's learn. Let's figure it out. Let's, let's grow together to answer that question. If we believe together, that's an important question to answer. Okay, but here's, here's, oh, thank you, LinkedIn user, for your lovely comment. <laughs> um, Okay, but here's here's what I have, right? Is that what if I'm anxious about the fact that I don't know and we might actually be screwed? Like, you know, Amy Cuddy talks about the perfect balance between competency and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. What's your advice on sort of experimenting with that in order to be a more vulnerable, but also create that holding environment kind of manager? Yeah, I, I you know, I think it's it's a lot of trying to find your own boundaries and limits to understand, you know, what is the, where, what is that boundary between, you know, absolute assurance and, and complete, I have no idea. And I'm, and how do I navigate that space between it in a way that is both uh, where I don't lose my own agency. I don't lose my authority right. um, because that still, I think is, is important, but where I also make space to, um, bring other people into the into the conversation, and, and, and again, you're navigating that. It, I, some story keeps coming back to my mind. Or at least a, a management tool that I always used when I was working with teams was, and, and I guess this flies in the face of what I was just saying. But there are certain things that your team knows, right? Your team sees things, and to assume that, that everything that's you know that, that you're doing is in your head and behind closed doors is just rec suggesting that people aren't aren't you know observant. And there, you know, when there are problems in the organization that, or challenges, however you want to define that, there are needs in the organization that you're not addressing as a manager because they're difficult, because they ask you to be vulnerable, they ask you to have a hard conversation or to make a difficult decision. I always go back to, but my people know, they see it. And if I don't act on this, the message that I'm giving is this thing isn't important or mm -hmm. I don't care or I don't have the, the skill or expertise or courage to do these things. And as a leader, I need to be able to step into these difficult moments. And knowing that that's what my team expects of me, that they see it, they might not agree with the, the way I, uh, the decisions I make or the directions I go, but there has been movement on issues that are difficult. And that I think starts to feed a loop of confidence. All right, we saw uh, you did, um, we talked about it and explained and we understand the context together. Now let's go to the next thing. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's how you find that boundary line, right? But it's letting your people inform you uh, in a way that allows you to act on their behalf. If I don't know if that makes sense. I think that's a really smart idea and, and, and actually to sort of really draw your limits, right? Because, because what I do see happening, which is also really hard, you know, is that you have a workforce that's empowered. You as a manager want to help them, but your management, your goals isn't 
allowing you the time and space to, and to do that. And so it can be, it can really press on our boundaries and our guilt and our anxiety when our people want stuff and we just we can't make it happen for them, right? right? Or we have to give them bad news. So how do we manage that reality, which is so, so real for a lot of managers right now? Yeah, it is. It's a tough challenge because you, as a, you know, as a manager, you don't want to pit your team against the company, right? right. I will, I would get you more resources if only upper management would would do the right thing. Get their heads yeah. out of there, you know what? Yeah, exactly. It just creates so much toxicity, but it does require you to be a champion for your people. Your role in management is to to keep your people empowered and engaged and and performing in a way that contributes to the goals of the organization. So if there's not clarity between you and the organization, where there's that misalignment, you're, you're destined for that situation you just described. So part of your challenge as a leader is leading up mm -hmm. to understand, you know, what are we trying to achieve? And if, if what we're trying to achieve at point B isn't aligned with what I'm trying to do with my group, or what I've been asked to do with my group, I need to to create that that bridge. We need to redraw the lines and be and have clarity with management, you know, upper management, or um, you know, you know, something something's going to break in that if we don't, don't. So it's not an either. We have to redraw those lines in a way. There's clarity and alignment and a through line from top to bottom, and that sometimes is less it is causes you to shift your function from how do I, how do I empower my people and engage my people and empower them to perform while also driving clarity up through the organization in a way that I can you know, create a, a virtuous loop of, of understanding. Yeah. Another question I get a lot, I'm going to give you all the hard ones is um, <laughs> so-and-so on my team really can't come in on Wednesdays. We're supposed to be here on Wednesdays. And I guess it's okay with me, but I really want to be fair because the other so-and-so on my team has to come in on Wednesdays. And I just don't know how to meet all of their expectations around flexibility. Help. <laughs> I get this a lot because I think with the new hybrid schedule and a workforce that if they can work from home really is going to push for it. You know, managers are often left making judgment calls and trying to be equitable in situations that can be challenging. Yeah. Well, I think you just hit the word. It's equitable, right? Um, it, you, I don't know how many children you have. You, I know you have one basketball player son, so you have two other children. They don't also play basketball, I'm it's guessing? not. Well, okay. one, is, one is being forced to try it. Okay. So <laughs> fair would be to give every child a basketball and a pair of sneakers for Christmas, right? Because they all get the same thing. <laughs> it, that's fair, but equitable be, would be to support the thing that the person needs, right? Um, and I think that's the the challenge. We we conflate fairness with with equity. You know, how do we make sure that people are given the tools they need to to do the work that's asked of them in a way that maximizes the benefit to everyone, the value creation across the board? And yeah, there are going to be some people who say, listen, I'm, I'm super sorry, but Wednesday is the day that I don't have childcare. Or um, I know I have to come in for Wednesday because of this. Um, what would help me is some, you know, being able to go home early on Friday or being able to work from home the other days of the week or, or whatever. But those are, are, that's where I think that the role of empathy comes in to really understand mm -hmm. what are your challenges? What challenges um, prevent you from being um, wholly engaged with your work? And I don't mean as a, that an empathetic boss is then responsible for solving all those things, but an empathetic leader is one who would say, all right, let's think about how we can solve these things together. And there are gonna be some places where it's not gonna work because we you actually have to be here Wednesday for that particular part of your job. So how else do we accommodate? What, uh, what can we do to solve the problem that's preventing you from coming in on Wednesday? And I think it's it becomes a conversation, not a, um, you know, everybody has to show up on Wednesday uh, question because everybody showing up on Wednesday is probably not even actually good for the business. Mm. Why is being an empathic leader an advantage? Like what is, the, what is, tell us, tell us as we round out here, what that means in practice. I, you know, I think in a nutshell, it's I get to come to work more fully who I am as a leader 
and understand uh, what uh, motivates and engages people. And that makes my job easier. It's harder in some ways, right? Because I, I can't just say, do what I say. Right. Don't ask questions. Um, Which is frankly what a lot of working parents did before the pandemic. We just didn't ask. We assumed that childcare was not our boss's problem, that it was just not work stuff. We were going to figure it out on the back end, right? No matter how stressful. Right. And, and it's, again, it's not necessarily organizations problem to solve, but it's their problem to understand. Mm. We've got this, this, this super high performing person who has this challenge in the moment. Do we, um, is there anything we as an organization can do? And I'm gonna, you know, being really blunt, not necessarily to help the person, although that's the, that is the consequence, but to help our organization get the value of that person. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the way if if you if a, a, a an employee is showing up stressed because their the, their children don't have proper care that they um, are looking at the clock all the time because they know the phone call is going to come or they are worried about a, a, a sick child or parent or or any of the things right they go along and then that pre pandemic no one talked about right you, like oh my god you had terminal cancer and we didn't know um you dropped dead on the job but you did such a good job right up to that last moment <laughs> we were kind of told to keep all our personal stuff to ourselves right? yeah. and now it's like oh my god is this going on with you well if you don't get the support you need i don't get the value you create yeah so it's it's the exchange where Again, if we think about pre the pre-pandemic industrial economy, it was you show up for these hours, I pay you for those hours. You perform in these hours. If you underperform in these hours, I don't pay you, and you're fired. You know. Now I think we're in a place that is come be who you are, and let's see how we create value. Let's how do we? I value you because you deliver value to my organization, and if you need. And I'm going to use this term that gets so misused, but if you need accommodation because of childcare issues or health issues or commute issues or whatever the issues, then we're going to do that because the benefit accrues to the organization if you are fully able to perform at work and perform in your work. And I think that's the mindset shift that we need to do, we need to have as, as leaders of organizations that in order for benefit and value to accrue to the organization, we have to create an environment where it's not just you work and get paid, but you work and you get the resources and the environment you need to be productive so that we can we can create value together. Yeah. But you have to do a good job too. There's two pieces, I think, to the equation, which is yes. if I'm going to risk and stuff for you, you've, you've got to do a good job. Oh, absolutely. And I think I get this a lot. Well, that's empathy. That just means being nice to people and giving them everything you want. And it's not, it doesn't. It, it means understanding where they are. But it also does mean accountability. Mm -hmm. I, an empathetic leader is not a uh, not doing her job if it's uh, they, they aren't showing up and they're slacking off and they're not doing the work. But it's OK. They, they're having trouble at home. That's not empathy. That's not empathy. That's ignoring the problem, right? It's I, I understand that that you've got problem. These are the things we need. Like I need you to do A, B, and C in order for us to create this value together. What do you need to do that? And sometimes the answer is going to be, you know, there's just no possible way I can deliver that right now. And then that's a different conversation. Yeah. But it's not. I'm going to. I'm going to release you of all responsibility, all accountability for the role that you play. And I think we have to, to understand that, you know, again, empathy is not a one way, uh, one way. I need to understand and know and think and walk in your shoes and be able to experience and solve your problems and give you slack because I want to be a nice boss. Um, I would argue that being a nice boss, if that's how you would define it, is not being a kind boss. Mm. Right? Kind boss is someone who, or leader is someone who will say, listen, I, I know that things are, are this way. This is what I need. How can I help you achieve what I need, what the organization needs? And if I can help, we're going to help. If, if it's not possible, then I'm going to help you find a place where you can be productive and, and have your needs met. 
because I has, also have to have my needs met. And that's not, you know, being a, a bad boss. It's just being, you know, working in a reality that exists. Yeah. And so balancing those things is I would much rather uh, someone come to me and say, listen, you're not, you're not performing at what we need or, or the team's not feeling like you're fitting in or, and, and let's, let's see if we can change that situation rather than going along thinking I'm performing, but kind of feeling a weird vibe in the organization or not getting my Christmas bonus, but I didn't know I wasn't going, you know, all those things that being nice uh, seems to suggest but also ultimately aren't very kind. Right, because that's just avoidance. And I've, I've definitely done it. Sometimes it just feels easier. <laughs> well, we'll wait till after the holidays. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, Chris, thank you so much. Um, and listeners, do check, check out The Empathy Advantage and have a wonderful holiday. Hey, you too. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks.